戦湯からの歩み戦争体験者戦中戦後の証言映像沖縄県は第二次世界大戦において日本で唯一の県民を総動員した地上戦を経験し20万人世の尊い命とかけがえのない文化遺産を失いました地獄のような戦場をくぐり抜け愛する家族を失った悲しみを抱えながら生き延びた人々は心身ともに深く傷つきました多くの人々が生きていくために必要な生活手段や財産も全て失いましたた戦争によって破壊された故郷を再生復興していくためには生きていくための食料を確保するだけでなく不発弾や武器の残骸を取り除き住む家を建てることから始めなければなりませんでした。すべてゼロからの出発となりました苦しい状況の中にあっても沖縄の人々は絶望の淵から立ち上がり一歩一歩前へと踏み出していきました沖縄県平和記念資料館ではこの度戦争体験者の証言映像「戦湯からの歩み」を制作し沖縄本島および離島日本本土台湾サイパン満州などで戦争を体験された30名による戦前から戦後の復興までの証言映像を公開しています。各証言は日本語のほか多言語で公開しています。ここでは6名の方々による証言内容の一部をご紹介します。On January 25th, the people of Moashi village were to move to the south. The truck stopped at the location of present day Kompaku Memorial Tower in Komesu, Itoman. When I looked around, my feet in the surrounding areas, remains were scattered everywhere. The following day, people from Moashi village were gathered in an open area. There, the new village chief spoke to us. I'm Kazunobu Kaneshiro, your new village mayor. We are here because we can't enter Mawashi village since the US military is stationed there. As you all know, in this area are bones of the many who lost their lives. We cannot live our lives as humans while stepping on these bones. Let's restart our lives by collecting these bones. For families with two adults, one should gather food while the other gathers remains. That's how I think we should proceed. Those were his words. Once permission was granted by the US military, members were recruited for a bone collection team. We began by collecting the remains of our own relatives. We collected the bones of family members and relatives whom we knew where they were buried. We were then divided into three groups, and each group of the bone collection team was in charge of a certain area. 
That's how the work began. We worked under the direction of the collection team. What do you see here inside the bones are fragments of shells. It won't explode, so you can pick up the bones. That's the type of instruction we received. Before picking up remains, we would put our palms together and say, Kuburi Sabira, excuse me. As even living people would feel uneasy if they didn't know where they were being taken. Then we would say, Uchike Sabira, do not worry, I will show you the way. We were told to always put our palms together and said, Kuburi Sabira. We were taught to pick up the bones of the limbs first, then the skull at last, and to place the skull on top when putting it in the bag. Once we learned that we would be able to repatriate to Japan from Manchuria, we headed for a place called Harbin. For about two months, we walked toward Harbin, night and day, during hours when there were no bandits. Babies didn't know any better. The leaders of the emigrant group told the parents to kill their babies since they would cause trouble for everyone if they kept crying. I think it was a cruel command that parents could not bear. I didn't see any children get killed, but sometimes it felt like the crying would stop after the order to kill was given. When we had to cross rivers, small children didn't want to cross the river, so they would start crying. Parents would leave their crying children in the rivers. When I think about it now, the road home was truly hell on earth. The situation forced us to choose between abandoning the children or selling them to the Chinese, leaving only the adults to evacuate in either case. My family didn't have to make those kinds of decisions. That's because all four of my younger siblings had already died in the settlement by the end of our first winter there. My mother, older sister, and I were the only ones left. In any case, during the war, the people of Ie Island were badly hurt. They overcame hardships in the internment camps and refugee life. They didn't have the time or leeway to allow their mental and physical fatigue to heal. And there, with their bodies and spirits already completely exhausted, they got back on their feet, telling themselves to stay strong, picking themselves up from the rubble, and work ceaselessly to survive. It was at such a time when the explosion occurred. This was the explosion of the LCT, U.S. military ship carrying bombs. Just when we were starting to believe that we could survive through hard efforts and were gradually regaining our dreams and our ability to smile, that tragic incident occurred, pouring salt all over our wounds. After that, there were many people 
particularly those who had lost family members in the explosion, who had lost their will to live, and all hope for life. That's how it was. Still, we had to keep living. We felt like we had to do something every day to get our lives back together. So we pulled ourselves to our feet. I attended Koza High School. The school was a large and tall quonset built in the former U.S. military barrack area. There were also thatched roofed and galvanized iron school buildings, all of which we built ourselves. We did all the work ourselves, using supplies that were given to us as well as those we collected. The Quonset school building was provided to us by the U.S. Army and located in Awase. All the students dismantled the Quonset, hauling it along the steep hill in Awase. High schools at the time employed a four-year system, but this changed when the 633 system was adopted. Since I was in my second year of high school at the time, I thought under the new system that I would graduate after that year. Instead, I had to remain a second year for two years in a row. Students in their second year as a second year student were called new second years. And we graduated after our third year. So we had four years of high school in total. The school was called Koza High School when we first entered, and its name changed to Koza Kotogako by graduation. Our citizenship was tossed about carelessly. My father immigrated to Ishigaki Island before the war as a Japanese national. Then Japan was defeated, and he became a foreigner, and thus lost his citizenship. After that, we carried our little residence permit cards on us all the time. I entered high school, and as a first year, I was often selected to make a presentation for the agricultural club outside of the prefecture. But I had no passport, so I was never sent. I was born in Yayama and was Japanese at birth. But the Treaty of San Francisco came into effect and made me non-Japanese. Even though I had graduated from the agriculture and forestry high school, I had to farm because my father's property had been seized. I didn't have Japanese citizenship, so I couldn't borrow government funds, and I couldn't use any public loans. Then. There was the problem of marriage. If I married a Japanese woman, I was extremely worried and distressed that any child who was born would be illegitimate. There was a branch of the Ministry of Justice in Naha. My father argued back and forth with them about the naturalization documents. We were told that we would have to get a certificate from Taiwan proving that we relinquished our citizenship. But we were born in Yayama, so we had no Taiwanese family registered and had no way to get the certificate. My father persisted, 
saying, We came to Japan as Japanese people before the war. Then Japan lost and our citizenship was arbitrarily up in the air. So, accept this application as if we were stateless and our application for naturalization was accepted. When I turned 20, I applied for naturalization right away and got approved in one year. We came home tired from the war, and even if our family was together, I was at a loss as to how I was going to live. Luckily, at that time, the Life Improvement Group helped encourage us after the war. We all strongly desired for recovery from the post-war era. I made it through the war and survived. And now that I was living and blessed with children, I wanted to somehow make a good living. That desire led to the hope that things will be better tomorrow. Herringbone twill uniforms were green clothes worn by American troops, and those working military jobs would bring back old HBT uniforms, which we carefully disassembled to make clothing we could wear. We had no clothing for babies that were born at the time. We would use cloth from US military parachutes for clothes. Thinking back, it was amusing and brings a tear to my eye. But we would find parachutes that were torn from being caught on things around the airport nearby. We would go searching for them and make baby clothes with the soft material from the parachutes, giving them to families that gave birth to babies. Once the baby could walk, we would make simple clothes like pants and vests out of HBT uniforms. There was no distinction between boys and girls, so we added embroidery for girls. That's how post-war embroidery started.戦後戦争の実相と教訓。そして戦後の復興へ挑む人々の足跡について証言映像を通して知っていただきたいと思います。